day, everybody. I'm Jeff Edwards for uh, University of Wyoming Extension, and uh, welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live on this uh, hopefully thawing out day, <laughs> finally. Um, my co-host today is Jeremiah Vardaman. Good morning, Jeremiah. Morning. Glad to have you uh, alongside today. And also in the background, uh, you might not see her, but you may hear her is Jenny Thompson, also a co-host of the program. She's the one that keeps everything running smoothly and recorded and posted and questions and those types of things. And our guest today is Scott Shell. He's the extension entomologist for the University of Wyoming. And our topics today will be uh, in, including some nuisance pests. But before we get to that, a couple of things that um, I'd like to mention. If you're new to Zoom, um, if you have questions or comments, if you take your mouse and scroll over the top of the screen at the bottom, there will be a series of buttons. And uh, you can ask questions of Scott either using the Q&A button or the chat. Um, just type in what you want to know and we'll take that question forward to Scott as he's uh, presenting. And uh, those of you who are participating in Facebook, use the comment section. Jenny is monitoring Facebook and she will push questions uh, to us via the chat or she'll ask them directly. Um, I think I think I got it all, didn't I? I, I think started we're good. Okay. We're ready right. to get started. You got to have that check. Scott, again, welcome for, uh, welcome for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you being here. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Uh, let's get after it. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, happy to be here. I'll share my screen and uh, we'll get it started. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about some of the... Uh, bothersome pests that show up uh, in the early spring. You know, we're still in winter right now, but I thought it would be a good topic to cover uh, to get people prepped perhaps to uh, yeah, deal with some of our common nuisance pests that, that uh, can be uh, a problem later in the season. So if I, I, do, if I do mention any trade names, it's not uh, to imply an endorsement. <clears throat> Uh, I'll start off with one that's not an insect pest, uh, but uh, entomologists, we, we get uh, to cover uh, other types of arthropods, including mites. And uh, uh, I always feel that, you know, besides the robins showing up in the springtime, uh, uh, when I get my first complaints about clover mites, uh, that's a sure sign of spring. So clover mites are kind of a misnomer in a little ways in that uh, they also feed on grasses, not just clover in lawns. Uh, you can see here, here's a picture of them. They have eight legs and a one part body as a, as a mite. Uh, they're tiny, uh, but they are, can be very numerous and they have a piercing sucking mouth part and they can suck the cell contents out of plants and, and so cause lawn damage and then also uh, because of their behavior, uh, they can get up, uh, move from the lawn and get up on buildings and then eventually get inside of buildings and be a nuisance there. They don't really cause any damage. They don't bite people. Uh, their biggest issue is uh, if you accidentally squish them on, uh, especially like a white surface, their, uh, their blood uh, for uh it's not quite blood, but uh, their body fluids, I guess you'd say, can stain the paint. So, and so again, Scott, wow. And yeah. Scott, when there's an outbreak, there's usually a lot of them, right? That they, that's why people notice them. Yeah, yeah. And they're showing up in places like, say, they maybe not noticing, you know, they'll, they'll see, say, lawn damage. And usually the lawn damage occurs on the south and west sides of, of uh, uh, lawns uh, and uh, then, but when they get very numerous and get up into the buildings, uh, they crawl up the siding and then, you know, uh, they're so tiny, they can come in around the cracks around windows because windows can't really be, you know, hermetically sealed. There's always got to be gaps and they have to allow water that, you know, hits it and drains out. Sure. And those are like Holland tunnels for the little mites. 
super high. On that, Scott, do these mice just live within our lawns or are they moving into our lawns in the spring? How does that kind of life cycle work a little bit? Yeah, they're, they're present in the lawns and they're a cool season uh, feeder in that uh, they, they, uh, there'll be some of them at some stage throughout the year in the lawns, but uh, their populations increase dramatically uh, and uh, the, their damage, you know, as things, uh, they're probably more distributed through the lawn evenly, but they're attracted to the warmth of those south and west facing walls. And so they'll move in there and then concentrate in those areas. And, and certainly that uh, is problematic for the lawns because a lot of times real early in the spring, nobody's watering yet. Because either if you have a sprinkler system, you don't want to take a chance of you know, having a freeze or dragging out hoses and those types of things. Because that is one of the, you know, the best things you can do is get your lawn to outgrow the, the feeding damage of the mites and, and water that. And, and, uh, but the other thing, especially like in commercial buildings, a lot of times you know, they always have that gravel barrier and that helps because the mites won't cross that gravel barrier they uh, to get to the house to get up on the siding so uh, that 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 is the thing about them they are ubiquitous and as of course a lot of times if, if you've had that problem once you'll have it again there's you know you've got a, a lawn that's feeding them and you've got a building situation that is attracted to them so the and management if, you, if you're getting them into your house is is that just that that physical barrier and mm -hmm. you will prevent them from coming back in or crawling on the house is that right yeah if you don't want to remove the lawn put in gravel or, or some other type of physical barrier you can uh, uh, apply uh, products that are labeled for this exterior usually they are contain uh, you know uh, synthetic pyrethroids like bifenthrin which is uh doesn't stain is odorless and colorless so you can apply it to the house and foundation and and it then is, as the mites try to crawl up that exterior you know it'll kill them uh so that that is one way to fight them uh, uh, to prevent them from getting inside once they get inside uh i generally say you know you can go ahead you could get a household spray and kill them uh, but then you have to clean them up anyway. So I recommend a vacuum with the soft brush uh, so you don't squish them. You know, that's the, the thing about it. Uh, to, uh, you don't want to have the paint staining is a real big issue. Great. So then if, so, if you did that, it would be a two-step cleanup process, right? Yeah. You would, you, you would then, <laughs> well, after you mash them, then you would have to wash. <laughs> <this>. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Well, and then like, say, if you if you sprayed them with some sort of household uh, uh, pesticide, you know, then you'd have to clean up their little bodies that are laying on the floor, which, uh, you know, that, but again, that you, you minimize your exposure to pesticides. And so that's yeah. always a good idea anytime is, is to minimize it. And so keeping them outdoors and, you know, keeping your uh, lawn healthy uh, and, and certainly preventing the invasion, that's the biggest uh, thing with the culver mites. And so just watering and fertilizing that lawn and keeping it healthy, it'll just grow through that pest pressure. We don't really have to treat them in the lawn, it sounds like. <clears throat> right, right. Yeah, like I said, that if you can get water to it, you know, maybe drag out a hose if it's still early. You know, Wyoming's notorious for our fall springs and certainly uh, getting that uh, uh, lawn in situation. Because sometimes, you know, the lawns even dry out over the winter time. You get spots that... Uh, melt off or the snow never accumulates and you can get some winter burn so it's already kind of stressed so if you can get that water to it yep great so <laughs> we're switching to wasps it looks like yeah yeah to match uh, not quite the the species that you guys have behind you but i'll talk about that one here in a second so another thing that people can do early in the spring to prevent problems later in the summertime is to get the yellow jacket wasp traps uh, either homemade or, or purchased and put them out uh, you know if, the, if you have problems especially I, I think most people uh, really start to notice the yellow jackets later in the summer you know it's picnic time and uh, some people call these meat bees because uh, uh, they have an affinity for uh, 
you know, meat, uh, raw meat, you know, if you're trying to go out and throw some hamburgers on the grill, they're fighting you for each patty before you get it on there. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, they're really uh, pestiferous and they're, they're also um, in studies that have been done uh, nine times out of 10, when people uh, are shown pictures of the insects that stung them, this is what they pick out are yellow jackets. They're not, you know, a lot of pe times people call them bee stings, but it's actually yellow jackets. They're the ones that do it. So the most problematic species are the Western yellow jackets. And that's because um, they are scavengers by nature. They, they are, you know, attracted to things, you know, like whether it's roadkill uh, or, you know, the garbage where there's scraps uh, put out. Uh, they will attract, uh, be attracted to those things. And again, that's why they're attracted to uh, picnics. The, the adults also like to, uh, uh, you know, they're liquid feeders, actually. Uh, they take that solid food back to the nest and feed it to their larvae. Uh, but they're attracted to sweet beverages and fermented beverages. So, so they're the ones that also crawl into pop cans or beer cans. And then when people go to take a drink, they get stung in the mouth. So uh, they're, they're, they're probably the least favored insect uh, of, in Wyoming. And, and so, general, in general, Scott, um, uh, when they, they, they really aren't after you to sting you, they'll, they, they really come after you if you harass them first, right? Yeah, well, like say, uh, when they're up there trying to steal your food on your plate and you're waving them away, you know, they... Uh, they don't immediately try to sting you, but they are very defensive of their nests. And because uh, the Western yellow jacket is a ground nester, sometimes their nest entrances can be very inconspicuous. And you might run into it accidentally, you know, you're mowing and say, uh, you know, you go by the hedge where you, you maybe don't always push the mower in as deep and you run it over the top of that entrance, they're going to come pouring out of there to defend it. Yeah. That's, that's also a situation where they'll, they'll sting people because they will aggressively defend their nest. And, and that, and if they're fruit, if you are a fruit producer, <clears throat> particularly raspberries, they'll get up into the canopy. And if you're picking in the raspberries, you might get, grab them with the berry and not know it and get stung. Oh yeah. Yeah. Western yellow jacket has a lot of bad habits. They, they will uh, get in and <laughs> damage uh, ripening fruit uh, in, in the berry patches. And uh, they uh, will also attack uh, weak honeybee colonies. Uh, so they uh, uh, will, you know, if, if say you've had a bad year for your honeybees, they are not uh, uh, been able to gather a lot of nectar and, or there's the disease or something like that. Western yellow jackets can overcome the defenses and start <laughs> stealing the, the uh, honeybee larva to take back to the nest to feed. And, and so they will, uh, uh, in natural habitats, they usually take over like a rodent burrow and uh, the queen starts the process early in the spring all by herself. And, uh, a young queen that made it in the fall, uh, got a fat reserve uh, uh, by eating usually carbohydrates, things like uh, honeydew or ripening fruit. And then she found a safe place to overwinter. And then she starts out all by herself. So if you can catch her or her first daughters, then you can prevent, say, having a nest produced that has 200 workers at the end of the summer. And, and the thing that's interesting about them, they're a paper wasp. And that refers to all of the uh, uh, members of the family Vespidae and that they utilize paper for their nests. And so this is a uh, a western yellow jacket nest that has been partially excavated and as the season goes along the workers are removing dirt and then adding more and more uh, cells uh, to raise the larva in and then uh, uh, the outer coating of paper to protect it so uh, that's it's one of those things the, you really don't realize uh, how many wasps can be contained in one of those nests until you excavate it <clears throat> they are well, also, what that is just crazy. I, I never had correlated that to that. I knew that there were some wasps and bees that were ground dwelling, but I thought there were more solitary, not these big nests and everything underground. That is, that is impressive. I, yeah. I had a question, Scott, on if they sting you. So you hear that with bees, like they can only sting you once and then the bee dies kind of concept. Is that, is that the same for wasps or do they just have unlimited stings basically? 
Well, I suppose they'd probably eventually run out of the, the venom, but uh, they don't have a barbed stinger. And so they can sting multiple times. And, and uh, that that's problematic. Uh, you know, you get one. Uh, I, I've been fairly fortunate in my life. I haven't been stung by too many, but I had one get up my pant leg one time when I was a kid. And yeah, I, I probably four or five times before I got it killed and my pants off. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar experience like that, but I was driving when it was doing it. So I'm sure that everybody thought that was rather hysterical while I was alongside the road trying to solve the problem. I think yeah. we've probably all had that experience. Uh, Scott, when you mentioned paper, that that is chewed up plant material, correct? That they yeah. are incorporating into their nest? Yeah. Yeah, they they uh, old wood fibers off of uh, you know weathered wood, uh, dead plant material from the previous year. You know that's all uh, cellulose, and then they they chew it up and masticate it and mix it with their saliva. It essentially makes like a paper mache, and and then they can form that out. And uh, uh, next slide here, I'll or two slides ahead i'll show you some and it it can be kind of pretty the way it's mm -hmm. formed under the different types of, of fiber so again uh like say really getting uh, uh you know if you can eliminate some of the queens you'll really reduce the population you're not going to eliminate them all you don't have to worry <clears throat> and don't have to worry about <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> the uh uh causing an extinction of the uh, western yellow jackets uh, and you will still have some probably come around your yard because uh, if they're if they're you know short of food, uh, they know that they'll go at least a thousand feet, if not further, uh, from their nests searching. So uh, certainly, you know, you're going to have some of them show up. So Scott, you mentioned you can put traps out in the spring. Uh, so will those traps catch the queen and those first daughters, or or are you really more targeting the worker wasp out of that and also can you tell us what to look for for a, a wasp trap how do they look what do i need to put in them how do they function the the commercial ones uh will generally be a, a bright yellow color uh that seems to be attractive to them uh, like i've seen uh, them uh, on the, the bright yellow plastic covers that are put around say pipes that uh, protect, uh, like the fuel pumps at the university have these bright yellow plastic covers uh, at parking lots around where you put the sharp shopping carts, sometimes they'll have that. And in the early spring, like April, uh, as things warm up, you get a nice day, you'll sometimes see uh, uh, like a lone yellow jacket out there on that, you know, investigating that bright yellow color. So lots of the commercial traps are bright yellow or at least have a yellow part. Uh, they'll have uh, uh, a lot of them come with a little packet uh, that contains uh, chemicals like heptobutyrate is one that uh, works against the Western yellow jacket. And you uh, add some water to it and it, it's essentially a one way trap. They go into it and then they can get trapped and, and drowned or, or just held in place and they can't get back out. <laughs> and yeah, if you're really targeting those new queens when they're first out, cause they have to forage by themselves in order to feed their first like three to five daughters that they'll produce. So they'll make a little, little uh, paper cell or, or multiple cells and then lay an egg. And when those eggs hatch, they have to go out and find suitable uh, food, whether it's scavenge stuff or if they find a, a cutworm, uh, something like that, soft bodied insect, they can take it back. They chew it up, make it into bug burger, and feed it to their larva, and and so that's uh, uh, how how the life cycle goes. So if you can interrupt that, you can prevent the whole colony. <clears throat> gotcha. So you said that there's uh, sometimes a chemical that comes with that that trap that you need to mix with water. Is that is that a type of pesticide? And and is there any concern I need to have with that around my property, either to me or maybe my animals? No, this is a, a physical uh, trap in, in that it's just an attractant to ap actually capture them physically. So it's not going to kill them. It's not like a bait that is then poisoned and brought back. And then, of course, some of the older uh, literature talks about using things like, say, a carp or a sucker uh, suspended over a bucket of soapy water. And the yellow jacket workers would come in and, and they'll uh, try to 
cut off a big chunk of it and and maybe they'll fall into the water with that and drown uh so that's you know that's not a chemical hazard but it'd be kind of a stinky process to have that for any length of time but yeah the, the commercial traps are are really um uh, you know they're designed to be relatively easy to use a lot of them will sell um you know once you get the plastic trap then you can get refills of the bait because the bait does eventually you know kind of it's volatile it has to be volatile to send out the 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 scent in order for them to find it and and so eventually it does wear down so if you got it early in the spring you would need to update it throughout the summer but again uh you know the getting it uh early uh, is good you know because you're better off catching a few in the spring even if it's you know if you catch uh four or five uh from when you put it out until uh you know the first week of june you probably really reduced the potential numbers in your backyard later in the summer. <clears throat> Scott, you're about the only guy I know that can say bug burger with a straight face. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I guess it comes with the territory, Jeff. I guess. Yes, it does. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing I always want to uh, emphasize is we don't want to confuse yellow jacket wasp with honeybees. You know, because I think it all goes back to the days when uh, cartoonists would make honeybees be bright yellow and black. And that's warning coloration for yellow jackets. Uh, our typical honeybees are kind of fuzzy and there's some banding, but it's more like a tan or reddish tan uh, type coloration. So very different. <clears throat> it, as a story on my uh, uh, friends that lived in Laramie, um, uh, they had a, a patch of iris or tulips by their front stoop. And um, one time I stopped by to visit them and I noticed honeybees out there. It was very early in the spring before anything was blooming. Uh, they, uh, in the city of Laramie, on the north side of Labonte Park, they have a honeybee colony. And uh, the honeybee colony was out there uh, looking for something to eat and uh, they weren't finding it, but they were finding these little particles of coffee grounds and they probably wanted to wake up after their long winter uh, and so they were out there and i was taking pictures and my friend carol steps out on the stoop and she says oh let me go get the bug spray i'll get rid of those things <laughs> so i had to wave them off because you know she didn't recognize them as honeybees so uh, again it's something to keep in mind we don't want to harm uh, our honeybees uh, and and uh, certainly don't want to confuse them now, there are related uh, vespid or paper wasp species that uh, they aren't as pestiferous normally, unless you run into them, uh, you know, or disturb the nest unintentionally, they, they can be a problem. So uh, this is uh, the bald-faced hornet. It's actually, uh, it would be better to call it a black and white yellow jacket because <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not a vespa species. It's not a true hornet. Uh, they're usually larger than like Western yellow jackets or aerial yellow jackets. And if you've ever taken apart one of their paper nests uh, at the end of the season, there's usually lots of chunks of yellow and black exoskeleton in there because uh, their niche is to go after larger flying insects. They're good flyers. And so things like horse flies and wasps and, and other uh, flying insects will be nabbed by the, uh, the bald-faced hornets. And then another one, like I said, that I think gets blamed a lot for the bad behavior of the Western yellow jacket, the ground nesting one, is the aerial yellow jacket. And in towns, uh, they can either nest in natural habitat up in trees, or they really like the overhangs on houses and sheds and stuff like that. And so they'll get started and, and they can make a nest and it will get progressively bigger throughout the season. But again, uh, you will probably pick up some of them. They're more pure predators of other insects than Western yellow jackets. So they're not so likely to join you at your picnics, but you have to so, look real. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Scott. So um, in, in all reality, wasps are considered beneficial if you can if, if you're a homeowner if you get past the idea that hey they might sting me it, you have to kind of consider them to be a beneficial insect correct yeah yeah they help uh control the populations of leaf feeding insects naturally uh and it does it, you know sometimes people really um uh, 
I had I was contacted about a big bald faced uh, hornet nest. It was up in a tree, uh, probably you know 25 yards from any uh, entrance or coming or going. But they'd noticed that nest, and it was like all of a sudden, you know, we're going to have to get rid of that nest, even though it was at the end of the season and nobody had been stung. You know, the 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 bald faced hornets were probably up in the tree canopy for the most part hunting uh, leaf feeding insects. So it, it was one of those deals. Uh, if you can live in, um, uh, you know, uh, harmony with them, uh, you know, it, it, it's probably best to leave them alone. It's like the aerial yellow jackets. If they are building a nest over where you come and go, uh, like over a doorway, you probably should get rid of them because they will get defensive later in the season and, and maybe would sting you. But otherwise, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're not, they're less likely to cause you any problem. The way you can tell them apart, if you uh, uh, are curious about it, is the markings on what's called the, the abdomen and the gasters. So uh, the, they have these distinctive markings. There can be variations within species, but they, it's enough you can determine what, what you got. We, we have a question from Teresa. Do you have a picture to compare the aerial and Western yellow jackets? Um, well, this is the aerial yellow jacket, and, and one of the easiest ways here is they have the black mark on this first segment of the abdomen come down and touches the black segment on the second is kind of the easy way that I recognize it. And, and, and if you're a homeowner, you're probably not going to get that close to them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and then see here, here's a Western yellow jacket. They have more of a diamond shape and then there's the, it doesn't quite touch. So uh, that, that, that's one of the ways. And, and I'll actually uh, provide a reference. If you really are interested in yellow jackets, it's, it's a great reference to have that you can download and look at. Um, so the European paper wasp, uh, it doesn't come to all commercial yellow jacket traps. Uh, and it's a relatively new insect to North America. And it is different from say like the Western yellow jacket in some of its behaviors. It is uh, uh, probably more like an aerial yellow jacket. It's more of a pure predator, although they do have a bad habit of causing um, uh, damage to ripening fruit. And uh, the easiest way to tell them apart is that the bright orange antenna. So they, uh, our native species don't have that. And then uh, they have that uh, black and white coloration or black and yellow coloration of the uh, yellow jackets, but they're not hairy. And they're also a little bit longer, uh, especially on the hind legs and the way they fly, their hind legs kind of dangle. And, and so you have uh, a Western yellow jacket has a hairy body and is more compact. Its hind legs don't extend past the end of its abdomen. Black antenna. And then this is what our native northern paper wasps uh, uh, look like. So you can see their body shape is similar to the European paper wasp, but they don't have that uh, coloration. But they also have those long, dangly hind legs. We got a Scott. Uh Scott, we have a question from Amy. Uh, do the commercial traps that you discussed, do they trap all types of wasps, those three wasps in particular that are native? Mm -hmm. Even if we want to leave those aerial ones alone, does, is the trap attracted to all wasps or how does that work? Yeah, it kind of depends on the trap itself, but there are some like the WHY, I think it's Y traps, they now claim that the, they work against European paper wasp and 18 other species of, of wasps. So really broad spectrum. They have multiple uh, uh, chemical attractants in their bait. Uh, and, and so you are, um, you know, you are going to probably impact some of the aerial yellow jackets with, uh, when you do the early season trapping. Uh, again, uh, you're probably going to have less impact on them than perhaps the Western yellow jackets by where you place the traps. Uh, again, you know, aerial yellow jackets, they like to be working higher up in the canopy. And if you place the traps uh, around your yard lower down, you're probably going to uh, uh, take out more of your Western yellow jackets. 
Oh, that's good to know. And then are these European paper wasps attracted to those traps at all? Or is there something else when you look at? Well, the Y trap says that uh, they, they have formulation. One of the things that, uh, that uh, you need to, to make sure that you read it closely, because some of them will say that uh, uh, they'll have a European paper wasp, or not European paper wasp, they'll have European wasp or European hornet on the label. And that's different from European paper wasps. So European hornet is actually a, a species that was accidentally introduced from Europe. And it's a large species. It's a true hornet. Uh, and it do, its range doesn't extend this far west, but it is found back east. And, and so uh, some of those traps are available that work against it. Another one that we don't want to take, but we don't really have to worry about in Wyoming would be the cicada killers. Uh, they are another large uh, uh, type of wasp that is not a paper wasp uh, and they're essentially beneficial. You know, they, uh, they get their name from preying on other insects such as cicadas. Uh, and then uh, the, year, the Asian giant hornet is one that was accidentally introduced into the Pacific Northwest, and they're working hard to eradicate them. And they have not been found in Wyoming. And uh, uh, I think probably the closest state that they've been found in is, is Washington state so far. So uh, hopefully they can get them eradicated. Uh, uh, again, you know, there are very large insects. This, see, this is a, a picture of it eating a honeybee. So you can see what a typical honeybee size is and how big these uh, Asian giant hornets, they live up to their name. They have an all bright yellow head and conversely uh, to the others. Uh, so uh, again, on the trapping uh, of the European paper wasp, you can take advantage of their uh, taste for uh, ripening fruit and even you know, damaged fruits, maybe fermenting a little bit. Uh, Professor uh, Diane Alston at Utah State University, she developed a homemade trap for European paper wasps before any of the commercial ones were available. And uh, there's a YouTube link. I think Jenny's going to provide that too uh, in there where you can watch. It's made out of uh, like a, a two liter pop bottle. And it's relatively simple formula of some uh, diluted fruit juice and a little yeast to get it uh, started to ferment. And it, it works on the principle. They go down in there. Uh, there's a little, little bit of soap added to it too. So it has a, uh, acts as a wetting agent. So they go down in there to get a drink of that and poof, they get in and drown. And so you can put them up and try to uh, catch the queens early in the spring for them too. Uh, they are uh, uh, European paper wasps. They do make a nest of paper, but they don't cover it on the outside. And they usually like to have an overhang to give them overhead protection from the weather. Uh, and so they, uh, are, you know, right at home in people's yards because we make lots of structures where they can take advantage of. They also utilize cavities and, and uh, they are not thought to be as sting prone as Western yellow jackets, but they will defend their nest. And because their nests can be kind of hidden and out of sight, you can accidentally encounter them and get stung. So if I'm seeing those nests, uh, Scott, if I just knock those down with a broom or, or take a garden hose and spray them off the structure, is that enough to deter them if I just keep continually kind of harassing that and knocking that? Will they eventually move off and go somewhere else to build that structure or do I need to do a trap? Well, if you can, you know, if you encounter a nest that you want to remove, then uh, you can, uh, you should do it really early in, in the morning when it's cold uh, before they can fly very well because they will defend the nest. And then you can uh, either use like a wasp spray and saturate it and, and kill them that way and then remove the nest. Or uh, you can, you know, physically remove it. Uh, certainly, um, like I said, you, you want to be careful because they will defend it. Uh, uh, the Western yellow jacket, if, you know, say you've trapped and you missed one of the queens and they've got a nest uh, and you've discovered that entrance, you can kill them. Generally, uh, the foaming type uh, insecticide products that you can 
foam it real early in the morning. And so when they, the workers try to get out of the uh, uh, hole, they'll have to swim through that insecticidal foam. And conversely, if they come back through it, if you use a liquid on that hole, you know, the soil just kind of sucks it up and, and the, reduces the concentration. So the foaming type are better for the ground nesting Western yellow jackets. Uh, and, and so if you do encounter them uh, in a spot you want to remove them, you can uh, use a product like that. Um, so again, you, um, uh, they say that on some of them, uh, you know, if you have a large colony and you, you remove it and some of the workers were out there, they'll come back and they might even try to start to rebuild it, but without their queen, you know, they're not going to be successful, but they're, you know, that's their home. Essentially, they want to come back to it. Uh, so it, it is, uh, you know, they, the, it's remarkable how well attached those nests can be to structures. And so it can take some force to, to get them off of there. Oh, so we live in some pretty tight neighborhoods if we're in town and that. So some of these issues can be from our neighbors as well, right? So we got to think of how can we help protect against wasp or any of our control methods, but also it might be the wasp are coming from the neighbor's property too. Is that correct, Scott? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I said, you know, they can travel quite a ways to get to food. And so you, you still want to minimize anything that might attract them to your place. If you can, you know, the, uh, have garbage properly covered, uh, you know, it's one of those unfortunate things that, uh, you know, if say, if you've got a ras raspberry patch, in late summer and uh, the western yellow jackets are coming in to feed on the ripening berries uh, you know and you've done everything you can to, to eliminate yours you know they can be traveling quite a ways to get to a food source like that so it is there's there's no good solution if you can talk to your neighbors and institute like a neighborhood control because i don't think anybody likes western yellow jackets and and the trapping is is certainly uh you know even people who don't want to have any uh, uh thing to do with uh, insecticides uh the trapping is a, a method of a pretty targeted control uh, at at the pests great what else uh, well, again, like I said, there's uh, uh, YouTube with Diane Austin explaining about these things. In the Pacific Northwest, especially in cherry orchards, uh, European paper wasp can be very problematic. And so that, that this was, I think she did this back in like 2011, early on uh, as the way, you know, probably uh, you know, in a commercial setting, they'd probably do something different. But if you're a small vineyard or uh, orchard or few fruit trees or something like that, you can do this to help reduce your pest uh, problem. Uh, if you're really into yellow jackets, want to learn more about them, there's a great book that it was done by the USDA uh, and is available uh, online uh, through Utah State. They've scanned it in as a PDF. And then uh, I think Jenny's also made these available uh, in there. Uh, the Michigan State University uh, wrote a very interesting article on the uh, what I, I termed the Game of Thrones and that you, it's, as with most things with insects, the more you learn about it, the more complex it gets. But uh, yeah, the, the, the European paper wasp queen sometimes will have multiple queens and one will be the dominant and, and she subordinates the others. And then there will also be queens that weren't successful in establishing a nest but uh, are still alive and around, and then they can take over a nest of a different queen if, if say, she's killed. Uh, so, yeah, very interesting on these things. This also explains why they have been uh, very successful on their invasion and have displaced native paper wasps, too. That is, yeah, that'll be some interesting reading. <laughs> <laughs> So the next major nuisance pests that uh, I want to discuss are Miller moths. And uh, specifically, uh, Miller moth is kind of a generic term, talks about a lot of moths that uh, if you handle them or they're flying around uh, light in your, in your house, you often see all this looks like dust flying off. Well, it's actually little tiny scales coming off their body. But I'll talk about the Miller moth, which is the adult of the army cutworm mainly, because that's the one that's most problematic as a pest, uh, both as a crop pest 
and as a nuisance pest in their houses. So their uh, life cycle is such, um, they uh, will lay their eggs in the late summer, early fall, and the eggs hatch. And uh, during mild times that they will, uh, uh, will start eating plants and, and grow. And then when it gets too cold, they'll go into a diapause. Uh, but they're able to complete their development very early in the spring. <clears throat> and as, as caterpillars, you probably all encountered them uh, uh, cutworm, at least uh, in, in most likely the larva of the army cutworm. If you disturb them, they curl into a C. You know, they uh, uh, you know, flip over, say, uh, uh, landscaping boards or rocks out there in your garden when you're doing some early spring cleanup, and you'll encounter these things. Uh, they're uh, widespread. Uh, they are native species uh, found from the Northwest Territories of Canada down into Mexico and from uh, uh, Michigan and Missouri uh, in the east all the way to the uh, 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 west coast. So really huge uh, distribution, but their main habitat, you could say, uh, was the Great Plains the grasslands out there. So they like to eat grasses, but they're very versatile. They'll also eat other broadleaf plants. And they're mainly a crop pest of say small grains and uh, alfalfa uh, early in the spring, where uh, like say uh, they feed mainly when it's overcast or in dark or twilight. Uh, and, and so you may not encounter them uh, unless you look for them. Uh, but again, uh, so uh, they, will pupate after they've completed their development uh, in the soil. Uh, they have a naked pupa in that uh, a lot of moths will cover their pupa with silk and will be inside that. But they have an, uh, what's called a naked one. And that would be the abdomen here. This is, you can see here, that's the form of the wing. I should get a higher resolution picture of a, a pupa because uh, you can actually see all the parts. Those are the eyeballs and, and the, you can see the antenna all those types of things. And uh, they'll emerge uh, out and <clears throat> they will start a migration. And that's when they become problematic because uh, they, they're all moving to the mountains, essentially from the Great Plains to the mountains are the ones that cause us the problems. And so as they go along, the density of the migration gets higher and higher. Uh, army cutworms, uh, there are some exceptions, but what I think uh, the three main color forms, they all have these kind of kidney bean shapes on their wings. So their wings overlap the, uh, when they're at rest. And then you can see these little uh, either paisley or kidney bean shapes on there. This picture also illustrates part of the reason why they're such a nuisance pest is that um, when they go from a caterpillar to the adult form, that pupa, uh, they're doing a major restructuring in their body and uh, they uh, cannot uh, defecate. And so they are containing all those metabolic wastes. And as they fly and roost, they will uh, then uh, deposit those as uh, in meconium uh, and that stuff stains and is... Uh, uh, a real nuisance, you know, if you get a, get a bunch of them in your house and, and you get them and they stain on your wall, uh, those types of things, lampshades are another place they like to, to do that behavior, you know, it's, it's a mess. <clears throat> so that they will migrate long distances to spend the summer up in the high country. So that, again, that's uh, uh, an interesting behavior. Uh, and, and certainly, um, after the end of the summer, uh, they will make a reverse migration, laying eggs, uh, the females will, as they go. Uh, and they, as they encounter suitable habitat, as they move back out into the Great Plains, uh, they will lay eggs for the next generation. So these Miller moths, are they, the, the larva, is it a certain elevation that they're laying those eggs at or? Or is it a certain vegetation type that they're seeking out for those, those eggs? It's just um, a lot of times when I get phone calls about Miller moths, um, I explain to the people that have called in, most of the time when you're dealing with the adults, it's not from your property. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that correct, Scott? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've probably, uh, with a widespread distribution and uh, uh, a wide host range of plants that can produce it, 
you probably do have some uh, army cutworms on your property, but uh, they are, uh, you know, it, it's really the mass migration as it picks up uh, coming from the Great Plains. Uh, I collected some of the army cutworm adults uh, for the past two years or 2020 and 2021 for a graduate student from Montana State University, they were actually trying to look at how far are these things coming from? Uh, you know, what uh, is there certain distributions based on wind patterns that because they, they are strong flyers, but uh, they probably utilize some of the warm spring winds. I, I can certainly note that at my house. You know, I can go along, not have many Miller miles show up, and then we get, say, a front that brings in uh, air from the east or the southeast, and boom, I've got a bunch of Miller miles show up. We got a question from Marsha. What kind, oh, what can we do um, to minimize the numbers of moths in our homes and cabins, if anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll address that uh, a little bit further along to... to uh, help. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to provide a, the perfect answer because I still deal with them myself. Um, so uh, they are the, this genus, uh, uh, Yuxia. Uh, I, I got to always give it to the uh, entomologists who are taxonomists. They, they pick the hardest pronouncing or pronunciations for the most common insects. So this is uh, uh, the army cutworm is Yuxia oxalaris. But there is a bunch of them. I mean, that uh, uh, estimate here is 175 in this just genus alone. But it, really, it's oxalaris is uh, the major problem. Uh, but you can see a lot of different moths that will come out. And there's other cutworms that are problematic for people's gardens and lawns and farms and those types of things. Uh, you know, dingy cutworm, variegated cutworm. Uh, uh, like, say, there are, are several species that can be a problem. So, uh, like say, uh, over 250 species. And actually, this past fall, I had a lot of this particular species moving through uh, on the reverse migration. Uh, as you can see, it doesn't have the kidney beans. Uh, it doesn't show up really great in my poor photo. Uh, kind of a couple of black C's on there. I tentatively identified it as the clandestine dart moth. So another one of Noctuidae, uh, either dart or owlet moths are the common name for that a family. But again, uh, you can take pictures and uh, that's part of my job is I get to identify insects uh, either from pictures, uh, if I can do it from a picture, that's great, uh, uh, or uh, from a sample, which I might need uh, in, in some cases. Uh, there are ways to take pictures now that are amazing. You know this. This is just an iPad looking at the underside of a, what I think is a clandestine dart moth. Um, uh, I've got it up on a couple of coffee cups as a tripod to study it and have a little light to illuminate it. And it takes as good pictures as what uh, I had a $5,000 microscope with a $300 attachment for a digital camera, uh, you know, 12 years ago that didn't take as good of pictures as that. So you know, that's, that's one way you can get identifications, but yay technology. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so back to the Miller moth, the army cutworm adult, they are a major household nuisance and a crop pest some years. It all varies. And we think it's mainly due to, uh, abiotic effects, you know, that'd be like weather. And, and so, so, uh, I'm often asked about insects that have outbreaks. Well, how does this occur? Is this a cycle? Those types of things. And certainly there are, you know, this is a native insect. It has a lot of things that prey on it. Uh, but it is also uh, probably related more to uh, what's happening with the weather event. You can get an outbreak in two ways. You can have like 100% success of the hatch of the offspring of, of, from the previous year. And maybe that will provide an outbreak. Or you can have a, a tremendous amount of eggs produced and have high mortality, but have the survivors hatch at such numer numerous numbers that it can also be an outbreak. So there's multiple ways to have it occur. But uh, uh, like say, I think 2020 was a pretty uh, bad year 
Uh, and of course, when you think about that, that means that there's a lot of adults migrated through and then a lot of adults came back and, and laid eggs. But I, it didn't seem like 2021 was as bad, uh, at least in my area. Uh, they feed on nectar as adult moths. Now I've heard some people say, well, I'm gonna get rid of all the flowers around my house. I don't think that's, I would rather have uh, an occasional bad outbreak of Miller moths and not have any flowers around my house. So I, I don't know if that's a, a great uh, thing to do. Uh, and, and additionally, uh, uh, you can have them show up in places where there's not many flowers. Like I don't really have a lot of flowers around my house, but it, it, I, I also get them out in my barn, which is well away from the house. And, and my horses wouldn't allow any flowers to grow around their barn unless they're poisonous. So uh, I like say, I don't think that's a good uh, method of control. It, it's, but that long distance mass migration to the mountains in the spring is what brings them into conflict with us. And, and they are great flyers actually. The, the studies uh, done in the 60s, uh, where they had, the, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. Insects, a lot of times, if you get their feet off the ground, uh, they'll start to fly. So they'll glue something on their back where they can pick them up and then they'll just start to fly and, and they'll fly until they can't fly anymore. And, and, and they can estimate based on their speed of flight, how long they would have gone. Uh, that many of them would have flown up to 50 miles before they quit flying. And one flew continuously for 23 hours in the equivalent of 133 miles. So they I, are- Kind of well, like a Gary Larson cartoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's uh, one of those things. And they are uh, nectar feeding as they go. They're, they are moth and they have a little proboscis and they can nectar feed to get energy and, and as they go on their long migration. Now, this kind of addresses some of the questions about uh, uh, what can you do. Um, it is very hard to keep them out. So I have sighting on my house. I was trying to take this picture in relatively low light as the millers that had sheltered in the cracks and crevices around the sighting uh, came out uh, this, uh, uh, I think in the spring of 2020. Uh, it's very difficult to eliminate that. Uh, you know, I don't want to reside my house. Uh, you can also modify the building lights that attract them. And, uh, you know, the, some of the, they know that some of the lights produce uh, a spectrum that is more attractive to the uh, millers. Uh, so, you know, those would be like the bluish lights generally. Uh, they found that uh, miller moths are less attracted to the yellow colors. Uh, so those types of things, changing that out. But here's a picture looking out uh, the window. It's in the feed room of my uh, barn. And so there is no... There's no lights on in there to attract them. They just sheltered in there uh, the night uh, around dawn, the night or the day before. And uh, at the end of this day, they're getting ready to go out and start their migration to the snowy range. And uh, they seem to be able to find their way in a lot better than they can find their way out. So they, they <laughs> but, you know, so there is some things, you know, trying to seal them out is really good. Um, uh, the other thing too is, you know, either turning off your lights that are uh, shining above your entry doors, uh, at least during the Miller moth season, or modifying them to motion sensitive so they only come on if, you know, like you walk up to it, or uh, going to a yellow uh, colored uh, light. Now, I have some old incandescent yellow bug lights. And they say that the new LEDs are better in that they're more into the narrow spectrum because a yellow, an old incandescent yellow light is just a regular light bulb with yellow coloring. And so it's still producing all the incomplete spectrum, whereas LEDs are more sophisticated and they'll put, uh, uh, you know, it's more narrow spectrum. Uh, and then they also sell things that you can install where the light only comes on when it senses motion. So uh, those might be ways to help uh, minimize that. I, I also, uh, like say I have an attached garage and that's how I come and go in the house most of the time. I undo the light over my uh, door and put it over to the side. And, and so then uh, I can flip on the light switch and it goes on over there and the Miller Moss will fly over toward that light 
and then I can come go out the door with less chance of them getting in. So Beat and very, switch. very <laughs> complex. Yeah, you got, you got to have a, a complex uh, uh, strategy. The other thing that I do is you can put it like in a utility room or this is on a workbench in the garage where I get most of my Miller moths that end up in the house is make a light trap. And so this is uh, a little, uh, uh, it has a photoelectric eye, just a little night light that comes on uh, when it's dark in there. And it's over a pan of water with a little bit of soap in it. If you just have plain water, a Miller moth can land into it and swim around and crawl right back out of it. If it's got some soap, it's a wetting agent in and will drown them. And, and uh, so you, you wanna be careful with lights right by water, but uh, th this is a, a GF, uh, CI uh, protected circuit uh, and you know it, 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 but it, in a way it directs the Miller moths to a place where there'll be less damage I'd rather have them out there and getting caught in there rather than them getting in the house and then I have to try to figure out how to clean the spotting off the walls so again wow. that's 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 uh, it's not a great picture I was trying to take it in the dark to kind of simulate the uh what the final view is of a miller moth as it's coming in to investigate <laughs> that light so if they do get in your house uh scott you probably could i'm thinking insecticides might not work i mean i'm sure it does control them in that but it's probably just not worth the hassle of it but your, your suggestion earlier of a vacuum is that a possibility of of removing them from the the inside the structure that you don't want them at um in, in an effective means yeah yeah because that's uh uh i i i've got a, a shop back and i got a couple extra tubes on it that i can get them off you know because a lot of times they like to roost up around the upper edge of a room and you can uh, uh take them that way you know you don't really want to squish them because then you know you, you get bug guts on the wall uh, and even, you know, just the, the, all the scales will come off. So it's, uh, uh, yeah. And you really don't, I mean, I don't want to be spraying a household insecticide for this particular thing. You'd be all the time breathing the fumes of your, you know, product. Uh, so, uh, yeah, vacuums and, are good. And, and your cats and dogs can only eat so many. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well they are tasty food i mean maybe we ought to figure out a recipe for them and, and like say maybe uh, uh uh jeremiah you live up uh more close to grizzly country you know maybe you can get some biological control agents down uh low <laughs> <laughs> when they do pass through now and then um yeah. but we kind of prefer them up in the higher elevation it, it helps <laughs> yeah so the, that it, it's very interesting that uh, uh it turns out uh, the miller moths uh, have a, a role to play in the greater yellowstone ecosystem because they go up and they will shelter during the day uh under the rocks and talus slopes above say alpine areas where there's flowers you know because essentially the spring follows the elevation up and uh grizzly bears will spend all day flipping rocks eating miller moths and you know they're highly nutritious the miller moths are in the process of building up uh, uh energy reserves in order to, to uh, make eggs and then also do the return migration and so uh, a grizzly bear uh, yeah, it, it, it's pretty fascinating when you think about it. And like I said, I, I was cooperating with a, a Montana State grad student, and this part of the reason why they're interested in it is, um, you know, what is the role? You know, we, we think of them as just a nuisance, but before a European settlement, you know, there was a huge expanse of Miller moth uh, habitat that moved up to the high country and back down. So uh, an enormous amount of nutrients were brought up to the mountains. Grizzly bears, but other, uh, you know, birds, you know, birds love Miller moths. That's uh, in bats also uh, great food for them too. Yeah, I, I've talked to the large uh, carnivore biologist. So finally, I think we're probably getting pretty close to our end of our time here. I just wanted to briefly touch on some other early spring uh, uh, nuisances uh, that show up in houses, like false chinch bugs. Um, those are ones they overwinter as adults. 
uh, and they can feed on things like uh, you know, mustards, uh, weeds uh, would be a lot of times where you, you know, mustards are usually an early season plant and they can feed on that. And then as things dry out, uh, they can uh, move into houses. Uh, box elder bugs, conversely, they overwinter uh, a lot of times and can get into houses and then uh, will be a pest uh, trying to get back out on a nice uh, you know, March day uh, when it warms up and, and they, they might have been under your siding, but they decide to crawl inside your house rather than outside your house. Uh, then uh, uh, this is an interesting case, uh, weed bugs, Arisus crassus. Uh, this is a native insect. The only specimens that were in the uh, insect museum at UW were collected like in the 1890s in Yellowstone mm. Park. And uh, mm. for some reason, they started behaving badly up around Story in, in 2019. I had some complaints, complaints about these things invading houses. And uh, uh, they did it again last spring too. They were really numerous. Uh, and uh, we, uh, luckily we have a, a expert in Hemipter, which is the order that these things belong to who lives in Wyoming, Aaron Clark. And uh, he was able to identify this thing. And it turns out out in California, they're known to be a pest that uh, also caused this issue. Uh, but it was the first time I ever had it happen here. And then uh, lastly, uh, elm seed bugs, they also try to overwinter as adults. This is a brand new invasive insect. Um, this is an insect from uh, Eurasia. It's uh, uh, native host are Siberian elms. So it, unfortunately mm. it got introduced in the Pacific, Pacific Northwest first. Uh, 2011, uh, Idaho started having them. Uh, and, and then uh, unfortunately they got moved into uh, the state. Uh, so anywhere where you have uh, Siberian elms, you can have issues with uh, elm seed bugs showing up. They don't really hurt the trees so much because they'll feed mainly on the, uh, uh, you know, like the leaves. And then when the seeds form, they'll feed on the seeds with a piercing sucking mouth part. But they have that habit of trying to gather into houses uh, in the uh, fall to overwinter and uh, I'm told that when squished, they smell like a mixture of rotting cantaloupe and turpentine. So not, not a pleasant house gas. Yes. So perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. That's all. That's what everybody wants on their house or in their house, right? Yeah. Another reason to have your vacuum cleaner at the ready. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's one, <laughs> one of those things that in... Uh, yeah, I, I tell people uh, to, to try to check their seals on their doors, you know, the weather sealing, the, the sweep on the bottom, uh, those types of things. If nothing else, you may not keep all your nuisance pests out, but you might save on some heating bill. So, uh, <laughs> right. Is there, is there any, uh, something we can spray on the foundation of our house to keep them out, like a, an insecticide or anything that way around the frames of the doors or windows or around the foundation to, to as a deterrent maybe? Yeah, uh, there are uh, uh, some of the products labeled uh, that uh, have, you know, the synthetic pyrethroids that are labeled for those types of uh, structure protection or home defense, it's often called, uh, where you might get some benefit in that uh, uh, at least, you know, because a lot of times uh, they may get into the house and then when it gets cold they just are kind of in stasis you might not even know that they're there but when you get the the spring starts to warm things up that's like I said a lot of times they they may not go outside they may come on inside the house and so it, the those types of products might reduce their populations enough so that's we got a question uh from facebook from penny who says do box elder bugs hurt anything you know, they're, uh, they're more of a, a, a nuisance. Uh, they don't feed on anything in uh, houses per se. Um, I have seen uh, uh, like a box elder bug come up to an apple core and try to feed on it in the winter time. Uh, so they're, you know, a, a pure plant feeder. Uh, it's, I think it's more just mainly they're uh, being a nuisance. The other issue that can occur with any of these insects, if you, uh, you know, uh, if they die in place or are killed in place around windows, uh, those types of things, the accumulations of those bodies 
can then be attracted to uh, the carpet beetles. The, the, the carpet beetles will come in, lay their eggs, and then you can get those larvae in, uh, in doors. So that, that can be one issue that is a side issue to them. But yeah, the box elder bugs really don't hurt the box elder trees. Uh, and they're just more of a nuisance because they like to overwinter in our houses with us. Do they hurt any any of our plants outside? So like our flower beds or anything that might be planted around our landscape? Well, I think they're pretty much uh, exclusive uh, feeders on box elder trees. And uh, these are all members of the order Hemiptera. So they have a piercing sucking beak and uh, they feed on plant juices with that. So they don't chew on the leaves, but they can suck juices out and create a wound and you know, might have something to do with plant disease uh, uh, issues. But as far as I know, they're, you know they don't really harm uh, the uh, box elder by their feeding. Uh, again, the, you know, the, they really like to feed on the seeds later on in the season when they develop but they will feed on the other, you know, uh, fresh growth in the springtime. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess in my, my personal experience and, and what I've seen with the box elder bug and these elm seed bugs is they just get in high num high numbers on the house and structure and, and yeah. they just kind of look bad basically. <laughs> and then just creep people out and, and they're not really doing anything, just trying to find a hiding spot. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like say when you got like the lap siding, like I have on my house, you, you know, that's, there's a lot of area for them to, to crawl in and hide and then on a warm day, come out and sun themselves. And yeah, like uh, some people don't appreciate that. Right. <laughs> What's next, Scott? Let's, let's probably wrap up the show here. We're already over 11. So yeah, I, I think that's about it. Whoops. Uh, for today. I, uh, I was just, you know, if there was any further questions that I could try to answer again uh, for identification help, uh, uh, you can always contact me at insect ID at UWIO, uh, you know, send me pictures. I need pictures and then also information about where you're seeing it, what you saw it on, uh, and, and good pictures always help. If it, if it looks blurry to you, it's going to look blurry to me. Uh, you can, you can also use your uh, coffee cup as a tripod for uh, your smartphone and take pretty good uh, pictures too. So that's uh, one way to do it. Uh, uh, so uh, like I said, uh, I'm always happy to uh, try to answer questions on insects. Uh, those are the types of emails I, I enjoy trying to answer. Yeah, that's fantastic, Scott. Um, yeah, and so Scott, really, this is what he does. He's, a, he's our entomologist specialist down on campus. And, and whenever I get to interact with Scott, he, he always tells me it's a good day when he has to ID something. And, and that's what he likes. Um, and so with that, uh, we're going to close out the show. Uh, if you can get a hold of Scott, send an email to him at insectid at uwyo.edu. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Scott, for everything you've done and everything you've uh, provided us. Reach out to Scott if he can help you. And with that, we're going to close the show. And so again, thank you to all our participants. Thank you for everyone that um, that is that joined us on this show and 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 helped us with this and and your participation. Uh, we really appreciate it. We do these shows for you. And so please reach out to us, see what we can do to help you. If you want any other information, um, Jenny, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the show uh, or pulling up the website to show the Barnyards and Backyards website, uh, please uh, visit that website and see what you have, uh, what we have available for you. There's a treasure trove of information there. We also record these shows and post them back up on Barnyards and Backyards website. And we try and provide those links on the show. Uh, with that, with that recording right there. So it's a one-stop shop for you. Also, if you're interested in what we have coming up for the, for the rest of this spring, look at the, the schedule there that we have. We also have um, an extension office in every county in the state and one on the Wind River Indian Reservation. So please stop in and talk to your extension educator. Um, they can also connect you down to Scott. And with that, we, uh, excuse me, uh, Jenny put the evaluation link in the comments section and in the chat box. And so if you'd please put that back into, um, fill that out for us and 
provide your feedback. We'd really appreciate it. Again, we do these shows for you. And with that, thank you again so much, Scott, for all your time and, and the great show. And with that, everybody have a great Friday afternoon.